Hey everybody, uh, good to talk with you again. Um, I wanted to read this week a short essay by uh, Swami Vivekananda. Uh, he gave this uh, talk, The Aim of Religion, um, as a way of introducing Western audiences to Vedanta. Uh, so it's a good and short summation of uh, the issues that uh, Vedanta sees with how we view knowledge and how we view the world, and also how this highest wisdom uh, is useful to us in terms of thinking about our own morality and about uh, evolution. So, um, an interesting viewpoint. Anyways, here we go. The Aim of Religion by Swami Vivekananda. The old dilemma, whether the tree precedes the seed or the seed the tree, runs through all our forms of knowledge. Whether intelligence is first in the order of being or matter, whether the idea is first or the external manifestation whether freedom is our true nature or bondage of law, whether thought creates matter or matter thought, whether the incessant change in nature precedes the idea of rest or the idea of rest precedes the idea of change. All these are questions of the same insoluble nature. Like the rise and fall of a series of waves, they follow one another in an invariable succession and men may take this side or that according to their tastes or education or peculiarity of temperaments. For instance, if it be said on the one hand that seeing the adjustment in nature of different parts, it is clear that it is the effect of intelligent work. On the other hand, it may be argued that intelligence itself being created by matter and force in the course of evolution could not have been before this world. If it be said that the production of every form must be preceded by an idea in the mind. It can be argued with equal force that the idea was itself created by various external experiences. On the one hand, the appeal is to our ever-present idea of freedom. On the other, to the fact that nothing in the universe being causeless, everything, both mental and physical, is rigidly bound by the law of causation. If it be affirmed that seeing the changes of the body induced by volition it is evident that thought is the creator of this body. It is equally clear that as change in the body induces a change in thought, the body must have produced the mind. If it be argued that the universal change must be the outcome of a preceding rest, equally logical argument can be adduced to show that the idea of unchangeability is only an illusory relative notion brought about by the comparative differences in motion. Thus, in the ultimate analysis, all knowledge resolves itself into this vicious circle, the indeterminate interdependence of cause and effect. Judging by the laws of reasoning, such knowledge is incorrect. And the most curious fact is that this knowledge is proved to be incorrect, not by comparison with knowledge which is true, but by the very laws which depend for their basis upon the self-same vicious circles. It is clear, therefore, that the peculiarity of all our knowledge is that it proves its own insufficiency. Again, we cannot say that it is, un that it is unreal, for all the reality we know and can think of is within this knowledge, nor can we deny that it is sufficient for all practical purposes. This state of human knowledge, which embraces within its scope both the external and internal worlds, is called maya. It is unreal because it proves its own incorrectness. It is real in the sense of being sufficient for all the needs of the animal man. Acting in the external world, maya manifests itself as the two powers of attraction and repulsion. In the internal, its manifestations are desire and non-desire, pravriti and nivriti. The whole world is trying to rush outwards. Each atom is trying to fly off from its center. In the internal world, each thought is trying to go beyond control. Again, each particle in the external world is checked by another force, the centripetal, and drawn towards the center. Similarly, in the thought world, the controlling power is checking all these outgoing desires. Desires of materialization, that is, being dragged down more and more to the plane of mechanical action, belong to the animal man. It is only when the desire to prevent all such bondage to the senses arises that religion dawns in the hearts of man. Thus we see that the whole scope of religion is to prevent man from falling into the bondage of the senses and to help him to assert his freedom. 
The first effort of this power of nivriti, moving inward, towards that end is called morality. The scope of all morality is to prevent this degradation and break this bondage. All morality can be divided into the positive and the negative elements. It says either do this or do not do this. When it says do not, it is evident that it is a check to a certain desire which would make a man a slave. When it says do, its scope is to show the way to freedom and to the breaking down of a certain degradation which has already seized the human heart. Now this morality is possible only if there be liberty to be attained by man. Apart from the question of the chances of attaining perfect liberty, it is clear that the whole universe is a case of struggle to expand, or in other words, to attain liberty. This infinite space is not sufficient for even one atom. The struggle for expansion must go on eternally until perfect liberty is attained. It cannot be said that this struggle to gain freedom is to avoid pain or to attain pleasure. The lowest grade of beings, who can have no such feeling, also are struggling for expansion. And according to many, man himself is the expansion of these lower beings. I hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you on Saturday. I hope you're all doing well. Take care.